Sean, we have a trade to, well, it's already been announced. Chris Tanev to the Dallas Stars. It happened Wednesday night. We're recording this Thursday. Hello and your thoughts. Well, first of all, this is a really special podcast. It's the Dan Rosen birthday podcast. Normally, yeah, today would be my birthday, 46. But we have freaking leap years. Thank you very much because this is the, we'll call it the birthday week. How about that? That's a big thing for my wife is birthday week. (laughs) But it only works on her side, not on my side. It's just birthday day (laughs) for me. But yeah, no, we have a trade, and if if last year is any indication, now the dam's going to open, right? There were, well, I think, 36 trades in the six days before the trade deadline kept us really busy, and, and I think the market's been set a little bit now. Yeah, I think you're right. On the D, the D market, except for a guy like Noah Hannafin, I think he's a bit of a unicorn in this market because he's 27 years old. He He's a guy that anybody who gets is going to want to sign to a long-term deal. Like Chris Tanev, Dallas, this is a rental. And what a deal, I think, for the Dallas Stars and Jim Neal to pull this off, their general manager. First off, they involved the New Jersey Devils. So Tanev goes from Calgary to Dallas by way of the New Jersey Devils for about a hot second on a paper transaction. But what that did, first Calgary retained 50%. Then the Devils got a fourth-round pick from Dallas to retain another 50%. So the Dallas Stars are getting Chris Tanev for a quarter of the price of what it would cost. And they did not have to give up their first round pick to do it. They did have to give up their second round pick. They had to give up a conditional third round pick in the 2026 draft. But that only goes to Calgary if they make the Stanley Cup final, if Dallas makes the Stanley Cup final. So, I mean, you'll give that up, pick three years down the road, third round pick. And they gave up a prospect, you know, a defense prospect, Artem Grushnikov. And he's a big, towering guy, guy, 20 years old. He was a second-round pick. So essentially, you look at it, they gave up two second-round picks to get Chris Tanev at a quarter of the price. This is a great deal for the Dallas Stars. And it, and it does. I think it sets the price for other guys in this D market, whether it's Sean Walker, if the Flyers are going to trade him, or Nick Sealer, or Matt Dumba. Maybe you don't have to give up your first-round pick unless you're acquiring Noah Hannafin. I mean, two second-round picks is... is is a decent price for for those kind of rentals um you know i i thought that the devil's facilitating that trade at first i was kind of like what the heck and then it's just an asset right for money that they got to use anyways so you know now they have another asset as they look for a goaltender or other pieces at first i thought that tanif was going to the devils and i'm like that's a really a good move because they could use some defense too but uh i look i think he's going to be perfect in dallas He's just what the doctor ordered, right? He's that stay at home, clear the net kind of D that really comes to the fore in the playoffs. The guy that you need in the playoffs to set the tone when series get physical and nasty and and you start developing hard matchups, right? And and guys start going head to head period after period, game after game. Like that that's where Tanf ex- excels. Just throw him on a pair with Miro Heiskin in and let it work, right? I mean, let Miro Heiskin and do what Miro does. Tanev's going to do what he does. It's going to work. There's no reason why it wouldn't work, and that opens it up if you're looking at a second pair. Now Thomas Harley can play on the second pair. Maybe a more comfortable spot for him as they get into a playoff situation. Maybe Essa Lindell on the other side. Who knows, right? But throw Tanev on the right side. Move Miro back to the left side. It works for the Dallas Stars. I, I like the move. But I particularly like the Devils getting involved in this, too, because they're doing the Calgary Flames a solid here, right? To get him in and and allow this trade, facilitate this trade. The Devils want to make a move with the Calgary Flames eventually, maybe for a goaltender, maybe for a goaltender, Jacob Markstrom and Noah Hannafin. Smart move by the Devils and Tom Fitzgerald, their general manager, just to get involved here, work a little bit with Craig Conroy and the Flames, see how they work a little bit. And maybe, uh, you know, in a couple of days or down the road in the summer, you make the deal that you want to make with them to get the goaltender that you want. Communication at this time of year is key. You know, we've talked to so many GMs in the past about what this week is like, and it's constant communication, right? Information is gold. And so when you're helping to facilitate a deal like that, you get an idea of what they value, who they value, what kind of players they want, what kind of other assets they want, and it can only help you in making the deals you want to make. I, I just I want to circle back to Dallas for a minute. You know, as you were going on and you were talking about how they're going to realign themselves, I, I think you put Dallas now in that equation of who has the best D in the league, right? As as a whole, and 
they're mostly out west, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's Vegas, and they use theirs to perfection in winning the cup. To me, it's Colorado because of how deep they go, and now it's Dallas, and they're all going to run into each other in the playoffs. You know, you look at it, right? Dallas went to the Western Conference Final last season. They ran into Vegas, and they didn't have quite the answer that Vegas had. In fact, it was Vegas's defense that really made the difference in that series. Big physical guys protect the front of the net as well as any other team in the league. Probably, you anyway, know, last season certainly better than any other team in the league, and potentially this season the same way. I, I think Vegas is still a, a, such a serious contender and, and also a little bit of a wild card here in the – trade deadline here what are they going to do because you can never count them out but now you look at Dallas they picked up a missing piece that they didn't have last season they can compete with Vegas they can compete with Colorado I think they're better than Colorado I think they're as good if Vegas is healthy 100% healthy and Dallas is 100% healthy I think it's a really close series I think it's way closer than it was last year in the Western Conference Final which went six games but Vegas was up three to nothing in that series right and then when it came down to game six and Vegas just said, all right, we, we have to stop this. I think they went out and won something like six to two or something like that, right? But now Dallas is right there. They are, they're legit. And Pete DeBoer, we know, has been a, a terrific coach wherever he's gone. But Jim Nill, and by the way, before I even go into Jim Nill, Jim Nill comes from Detroit, Sean. That's where he kind of honed his craft as an assistant general manager for years under Kenny Holland. We have Ken Daniels. Detroit Red Wings broadcaster who's going to join us on the podcast here shortly. We talked to Kenny about the Red Wings, but also about his call on Patrick Kane's overtime goal in Chicago, which we'll play for you as well. Just a terrific call. So we'll get to that soon. But back to Jim Nill, the Detroit angle kind of worked there because he was in Detroit for a while. The guy doesn't get enough credit for the job that he does. He's just a quietly good general manager. He's built this roster. He's built the team. He's built a prospect base. And in doing this trade, he didn't get rid of any of his top prospects. Guys like Logan Stankoven and Maverick Bork, they stay in Dallas. He keeps his first-round pick. He does a really good job, and the Dallas Stars regularly are a contender with Jim Neal. They went to the Stanley Cup Final, remember, in the bubble, and they just maintain, they've maintained. And they're probably better now and better suited now for a Stanley Cup run than they've ever been under Jim Neal, and he's been there for a while. He's fantastic, and he's one of those guys that just that you mentioned. He's quiet, right? Quietly goes about his business. He's professional, but there's no flamboyance. There's no big quote. You know, there there there's none of that, and and there's no flamboyant moves, right? Everything's calculated, so it's it all kind of goes under the radar. But I I, I think if you talk to that fraternity of GMs, uh, you know, I I think most of them would put him very near the top of the list of a who they want to deal with because it always seems to be a rather simple process, right? And and for the most part, fair, right? You don't want to make yep. deals that are lopsided. You can win one of those, but then you never go back to the table, right? It's like pushing all in all the time at poker. Eventually people just say, I'm not going to play. And you, you, you don't have anybody to dance with at that point. So I, I think he's been fantastic. I think he's for sure a top five GM in the league right now. Yeah, and you say fair. I mean, this is a fair trade for the Calgary Flames, too. Like you said, two second-round picks, essentially, and the potential for a third-round pick for a guy who they weren't going to re-sign who's 34 years old, that's a fair That's a fair deal. What's the deal for Noah Hannafin, though? That, to me, is the, the outlier here when you look at the defense market in this trade deadline, is the, the Noah Hannafin trade. Because if I'm acquiring Noah Hannafin, I want to know if I can sign him, right? That's a big part of this. And I think, A... That opens it up. That doesn't just mean a team that's contending right, you know, thinks it's going to contend right now. That that means if this can come with a with a sign in trade or a contract extension when he's acquired, like a Hampus Lindholm with Boston a couple of years ago, that opens the door for more teams to be involved, even ones that maybe aren't right now a Stanley Cup contender, but believe that they will they're they're on the cusp of that. New Jersey, you know, perfect example, right? That's the outlier here in this market. The other ones are rent more rentals. You have other guys who have one year remaining on their deal. A David Savard is a perfect example of a guy who could get moved with Montreal, one year left on his deal, but the Canadians are under no pressure to do it. But but Hannafin, they, ha- they have to move him, Calgary, because you can't lose him for nothing, and he clearly doesn't want to re-sign there unless there's a change of heart coming in the next eight days. You see, you got to move him. 
I, I don't know where he goes, and I don't know what the price is. It's got to be way higher than what the Tanev price was. Well, I don't know that it's going to be way higher because you just painted the picture, right? They're desperate. So if you're a good True. GM, oh, you want to make this deal? You don't want to lose him for nothing? Here's my best offer. But the thing that they're doing now that's really tricky is they're contending. They're five points out of the wild card. They've won four games in a row. Like, this is a really bitter pill, I think, for the players in that room to swallow. It's got to be because they've played their way into contention. They've played better. But all along, I think we knew. You know, All along, we all knew that this is what Calgary was going to do. They, they, they put that out there on January 31st when they traded Elias Lindholm, right? I mean... That was the that was the that was the signal. Okay, no matter what, we're selling. That we have to, and they have. To, they listen. Do you believe them to be a Stanley Cup contender? No, but did you believe the Florida Panthers to be a Stanley Cup contender? I didn't, and it's a great point. I think you though you know in hindsight you look at what the Florida Panthers had. They had a team built for playoffs, right? I mean that the, with this, and they and and they're proving that now. They proved it in the playoffs last year, and they're proving it all season. I think they're the best team in the NHL. You and I both have them in the number one spot in the Super 16. But you look at Calgary, there's holes all over the lineup. They did trade Lindholm. Now they've traded Tanev. Even before they traded Tanev, you look at it and say, can they compete in the West? Can they compete with Colorado and Dallas? Can they compete with Vegas and, and Edmonton and Vancouver uh, even L.A., I, like, I, I, I didn't see it before they made these moves. I think they had to be realistic here, and they are being realistic here. You know who believes they can compete? The players. The guys in the room. Yeah, I understand they that. They believe they can compete. They also had a coach not long ago who said, "You, what are we going to do, make the playoffs and then, what, be out in eight days? Because I think that's what would happen with the Calgary Flames. Well, that's not how players work, right? Like, that's not how players they, think, but managers can't always... think how players think. They always believe. And, and, and yeah, no, managers can't, but it's a really delicate walk because now how do you go to your team and say, I believe in you guys? Like, let's go. You can't. You don't. You can't say that okay. to them. They're, don't lie to them, right? <laughs> like, we're tearing this thing apart, guys. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I believe in you. We just, we're going to rip three huge pieces out in Lindholm, Tanev, and Hannafin. But, yeah, guys, go ahead. I mean, that's the players are smart. They're going to read right through that. You can't do that if you're if you're Craig Conroy, their general manager. You don't go walk into the room and say, all right, guys, I still believe this is a playoff team. You say, all right, guys, let's go play your hardest and see where we can finish. We still we st we, we still want to go, but we you have to understand what we're trying to do here. You got to be honest with the players. They're they're too smart. They'll read right through that. Let's switch teams here before we get to Ken Daniels, Detroit Red Wings uh, broadcaster who uh, joined Sean and I and really a fun interview with Ken Daniels, insightful on the Detroit Red Wings. But we'll switch teams. The Nashville Predators are a different team, though. Different from Calgary, I look at Nashville, and yes, they're hot now. Six games in a row that they've won. Barry Trotz talked to Pierre Lebrun at The Athletic and basically said, we're keeping UC Soros, at least through the, this trade deadline, which they should do. I think they should be buyers. I think they should be big-time buyers because I don't think they're that far away from being in a playoff series with a team like Dallas or Colorado or whoever it might be. I think they can compete, especially with what they have on defense and what they have in net. I think they should be buyers. They have the cap space to do it. And more importantly, they have five guys who were first-round picks playing in Milwaukee of the American Hockey League right now. And they have the draft capital. They have four first-round picks in the next three years. They have, I think, I want to say something like four picks in the first two rounds of this year's draft or something along those lines. They've got the draft capital, they've got the cap space, and they've got the prospects. They have what it takes to buy at this deadline and not hurt their long-term future. I think they should be buyers at this deadline. Look, first of all, they can't lose in Milwaukee. So I know. They're like they're, I think it's 17 their, their winning streak was at, which is just crazy. But that's what got them in trouble, right? That's why they tore it apart and are kind of rebuilding it on the fly is they kept making trades – to try and win and eventually they became bloated and they couldn't deal with what they had and they needed relief and then they started moving players out and, and kind of you know have done a masterful job of rebuilding on the fly um, but I, I'm curious if maybe Barry Trotz who, who didn't live through a lot of the end of that he was already gone but I, I wonder if 
maybe he's a little gun shy seeing what happened and the fact that they did have to tear it down. Like they have a plan very much like Steve Eiserman, I think, where, you know, they know what they have and when it's going to come to fruition. And, you know, how much do you want to mess with that by moving pieces that you already have for what are going to essentially be rentals? But here's the thing. What they have is what a lot of teams don't have. They have the ability to get any piece they move to get rentals now back in the summer by trading UC Soros. They keep UC Soros through this. He's their number one guy. Askarov looks like he's a player, right? Askarov is in Milwaukee and he's dominating in Milwaukee right now. He looks like he's gonna he he has that potential to be what he had the potential to be when they drafted him, right? So you keep Soros, you add to this team, you make it better right now. And then in the offseason, you have the ability to trade Soros, believe in Askarov, have him come up and be your new guy, and recoup the pieces that you gave up. They have the ability to do that, along with, like I, what I said, the draft picks, the prospects, and the cap space to do it. If I'm Barry Trotz, Nashville Predators, it's a perfect position to be in, to be buyers at this year's deadline. They didn't sign Ryan O'Reilly to be a rebuilding team. They didn't sign Gustav Nyquist to be a rebuilding team. They signed these guys because they wanted to compete. Andrew they, they, and and Andrew and they've gotten better and better and better as the season's gone on with Andrew Burnett behind the bench. This team's this team can win. They can win. And then they can recoup what they lose or they trade away. Like I look at it right now, I mean they they could use a center. That's obvious, right? But they need a power play, and they need a their power play isn't very good. Their penalty kill isn't very good. Well, go out and get Jake Gensel if he's available. Put him on your power play. He's a goal scorer, right? Maybe even get a chance to re-sign him in the offseason with the money you're saving by trading UC Soros if that's the case. There's options there for Barry Trotz and the Nashville Predators. Why do you want to trade UC Soros so bad? Let me clarify this. I don't necessarily want to trade UC Soros. I think he is one of the top five, top three, maybe number one goalie in the league. But you do have a guy coming up behind him who you think could be. Now, you don't have to trade Soros. You keep him, and you can have Soros and Askarov as your your goalies next season and see where it goes from there. But if you're going to keep UC Soros and you're going to do that, you do run into the possibility that you're going to have to trade him next year. Because maybe you don't want to re-sign him. And you lose the value. He loses value if that's the case. Because a team acquiring him at this time next year only gets him for a quarter of the season and the and the playoffs. Team acquiring him in the offseason gets him for a full season, a full training camp, all that. I think there's a lot more value in trading Soros if you're going to do it. You don't have to. You could also re-sign him. But then what do you do with Askarov? You can keep both. Those are the, all the options on the table here for the Nashville Predators. But I do. Well, my point is, is that they could be buyers now and get back what they give away or trade away. But they're going to do that to become Stanley Cup contenders, yeah. which you would think would carry to next year. And then you're going to take a rookie goalie and say, here you go. Here's our Stanley Cup hopes. Good luck with this. I've never seen you play in the NHL. Let's have some fun. <laughs> There's risks everywhere, my friend. There's risks everywhere. And there's a risk in but keeping that doesn't Soros. Make any that doesn't make any sense. A goaltender is the most important piece to any Stanley Cup team. Any Stanley Cup team. Who is the most important piece to the Florida Panthers? Bob Rowski. There's arguments to be made for Barkov. There's arguments to be made for Matthew Kachuk. There's arguments to be made around. How many teams can you think of in, in recent vintage that didn't have an elite goalie? That Colorado. And Vegas, the last two Stanley Cup champions. Jordan Bennington had a great run. Is he an elite goalie? With the, Jordan with Bennington Lewis? was an elite goalie that He was year, playing yes. like an elite goalie. Yes. He was playing like an elite goalie. Yes. Okay, he's not an elite goalie. He was playing like one. But that's all that matters, is that you played he, like one. He got hot. He got hot. We've belabored it enough. Like, I think, I think the world of UC Soros. And I'm not saying they have to trade him. But there's options on the table for the Nashville Predators to get better right now and not really necessarily hurt their future at all in doing so. That is the point that I was trying to make. If the Nashville Predators trade 28-year-old UC Soros, it will be the biggest mistake that franchise ever made. 
Isn't it enough though that I'm on board with Nashville, whereas you've been on board with? I know. Welcome season? to the band. Welcome to the bandwagon. <laughs> it's a good bandwagon to be on. Uh, another one to be on too is the Detroit Red Wings. They've they've been red hot. Sixteen four and two in their last twenty two games. They've won six games in a row. Uh, Patrick Kane has a nine game point streak right now. He's got fourteen points in those nine games as we record this on Thursday. It's been a great run for the Red Wings, and it was a special night in Chicago for Patrick Kane. And Ken Daniels, who joins us on the podcast, had the call. So here's the call and then our interview with Ken Daniels. Bedard brings it to center. The Brinkett is back. Drop back. Jones. Jones right in. Save Reimer. Rebound save. Look out here. Look at this. Wide Look open. This. Up center ice. It's Patrick Kane in Chicago. Ken, thanks so much for joining us. There's so much to get to with the Red Wings, but I really wanted to start with your call of Patrick Kane's overtime goal in Chicago. He gives you the time to say it's Patrick Kane in Chicago because he slows it down. It's a great call, and then the story is complete after. Does that just come to you? How does that work for you? It honestly did. Uh, we we play light the lamp at the start of every every Red Wings broadcast, and I had the lead, and I think Mickey took the team that day, and I said, well, I'm taking Patrick Kane just for the story. Okay. And uh, then after to bring it, tied it up from Kane with about six seconds left, I remember saying, wouldn't it be something if Patrick Kane ended this thing? So we had talked about it, and I had talked with Patrick about the ovation and, and taking the turn at center ice and, and the acknowledgement and the fans, are they going to love it? And we talked at length about that in the room before we even uh, left on the trip. Uh, but did I envision him scoring? Yeah, probably 70% of me because it's Patrick Kane. So I thought, yeah, that could happen. But having a call, no. But when Debrinket shoveled it to center ice and he was in from center ice, there was no doubt in my mind he was scoring. And at that point, I was just waiting for him to score. And whatever came, came. And the nicest part for me, honestly, besides Patrick getting that, uh, was my daughter, who uh, works on the uh, cardiac ward at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago and lives around the corner from Patrick Kane, uh, that she was there with her fiancé right beside me in the booth. So that was pretty cool to share that moment. So, uh, Patrick, thank you. Um, the, the guy never ceases to amaze me. You see it from afar, but when you see it up close, it's true incredible i have goosebumps actually you telling me that story and you kind of stole my thunder a little bit but I, I wanted to ask you you've seen so many amazing performances right with the detroit red wings but I'm, I'm curious where you put patrick kane coming back from what he's come back from and being a point of game player for this team and and really giving them probably a large part of the playoff swagger identity that they have the swagger for sure uh the guys love patrick there's a confidence in the room now um, with everyone whom he plays with. He's one of those rare wingers who could actually drive a line. Uh, I didn't know how he'd be after resurfacing surgery. Nobody knew. Um, believe that Steve Eisman probably summertime had thought about Patrick Kane. And then it's, it's the great unknown, but it was worth the risk. Money didn't matter. They weren't up against the cap, and it's Patrick Kane, and he knew all about Detroit, played at Honey Bake, lived at Pat for Beak's house, familiar with the area. His good buddy Alex DeMarcan is here. So it all fit together. And as for me, watching him and the great players that I've been able to call here and fortunate enough to call with Mickey in 27 seasons now, Pavel Datsuk, I always waited till Pavel came over the boards, and you were just anticipation every game when Pavel might do something you'd never seen before. And now I have that same feeling. And I know Patrick Kane had told me he watched Pavel Datsuk lots living at Beaker's house uh, in his time uh, in Detroit. So um, yeah, I think watching uh, Pavel and watching Patrick is pretty incredible for me. The Red Wings, it, it, they certainly needed that jolt. Did they need the jolt to come from a guy who also understands a big market hockey, an original six market, an understanding of what fans want and, and the ability to to deliver on that too. I mean, is that part of this as well as he's got the pedigree, he's got the Stanley Cups, but also he has an understanding of what big market original six hockey is all about. 100%. He's a student of the game. He's a hockey geek. 
He watches everything. He doesn't miss a thing. He knows about the big market. And he said to me at one point, how fortunate uh, he is to have worn the Blackhawk jersey, the Ranger jersey, and the Red Wing jersey. Yeah, three of the original six, for sure. He understood that. And uh, we were talking one day, and I said, you know, you in a winged wheel does not look as strange to me as it did when Chris Chelios came, even though Chelios' heart, I think, was always in Chicago, and Patrick's probably always will be. But I think the hockey and playing and where he plays, it's part of the game and being part of something that's a little different for him. And as he said to me, he said, I think my time in New York, as short as it was, maybe helped that. And it's true. There was that transition from Chicago to New York to Detroit, and Chelly came right from uh, Chicago to Detroit, and Red Wing fans did warm up to Chelly, uh, even though it is retirement Jersey night, you wouldn't know that he was really ever a Red Wing. However, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Patrick just uh, has the moments understanding the game. He's not a huge talker, but I know, and the, and the coaches have said this and the players too, and publicly. And today I just uh, hosted a luncheon with Steve Eiserman and with Eric Lalone. And they, they had said how uh, Patrick knows the moments of when to speak uh, in the room and he can be vocal, but the guys know automatically. Patrick Kane's talking and they all know that they feel that they just know in the room it gives them you know another percentage chance of winning every game just looking around and seeing them there so it's it's a big factor him just knowing and, and the game and the original six matters how different is hockey in Detroit right now with the playoffs are right there they're two points behind the Toronto Maple Leafs you know that they have a extended lead now in in the wild card a little bit. I, I, there's no guarantees, but this is as relevant and as important as the Detroit Red Wings have been in a long time. And I'm curious what that's been like for you. It's been great. I mean, seven years without in a six game winning streak. Now it's the longest in the Steve Eisenman era. A uh, six game winning streak for the Red Wings. And as much as I think last year, I know last year at this time uh, was when they were in Ottawa, it wasn't a leap year, uh, but uh, Steve didn't have to go far on a leap to move what he moved at the deadline in Aronic and Bertuzzi. The, at, at just prior to this, the Red Wings won seven of eight a year ago. Uh, Tampa Bay came in, Rasmussen blocked a shot, and they lost him for the rest of the year. And that, that hurt, believe it or not. It really did. He's that type of player and just does a lot of little things that people don't really speak of in part why I got a four-year extension but Tampa Bay came in to Little Caesars uh Detroit have played Tampa Bay should have won that game and Vasilevsky was brilliant made 45 saves Red Wings lose three nothing going to Ottawa get pushed around literally figuratively every which way and that's when Steve decided it was over the Red Wings I believe were in the second wild card spot at that time but it you're hoping you're hoping uh, the hope isn't there. I think there's a reality there and a feeling that's different. No sure thing, but it's different. Yes, you're still battling there with, with Tampa Bay and a game in hand and you for two in hand. And then you're trying to chase down Toronto, whom I never thought would win five in a row without Morgan Riley. But they did that and won seven straight. But right now, after a loss to them and the Red Wings within two, yeah, there's, there's a much different feeling for the first time well, it'll be the first time in eight years they make the playoffs should they get there. There's a different feeling now because of the talent that is around. And I go back to always thinking that Steve Eisenman at the end of last season, if you, you probably recall, he said that Ottawa and Buffalo were ahead of Detroit in the rebuild. And that's not that he said they were necessarily better teams, but were ahead in the rebuild. The Red Wing prospects are really good, but they weren't ready. Where Buffalo's and Ottawa's prospects were closer those just coming. So then Steve goes out and he did what he did, knowing that perhaps he could sign Patrick Kane summertime and waiting to see how things go. But then at that point, you're you're adding Comfer, you're adding Daniel Sprong, you're adding Christian Fisher. When the guys speak of Christian Fisher, they absolutely love him. What a glue glad guy he is. And you add Shane Gostas Bear, who's helped the power play so much. You've been pushing Jake Wallman out of that role. Petrie can pay power play. You add him. So I think that Steve just knew if Ottawa and Buffalo were ahead in the rebuild, let's try to fix the present and be more competitive now without any huge long-term deals. But this team can be better right now and maybe push ahead of Ottawa and Buffalo and damn if he didn't do it. And that's the way it's working so far. So good. So now that brings us to what's coming up in the NHL, right? You got the trade deadline coming up. Uh, it's March 8th, next Friday. And while I don't know that the Red Wings will make a huge splash, because I, I, I don't know that Iserman wants to give up a lot of futures for present right now, if he likes the team that he has now, especially, 
what do they need though in your mind like i look at the i look at defense i wonder about their goaltending but then i look at it and say well they've given up 10 goals in the six game winning streak so is that good are they good enough there like there's a lot of things going well for Detroit right now, but in the big picture, Ken, what do you think that they could use? What could Steve do here to add to this team to just make it that much better and give them that much of a better chance? With a question you just asked, all those things you just said provide the answer, which I'd give you the same thing. Uh, I, the goaltending, yeah, Alex Lyon has been brilliant. And remember, didn't play until mid-November in Sweden. They weren't sure, I think, coming in who was number one. Yeah, they added Reimer as a depth guy in a one-year. Lyon, the best bargain in the National Hockey League in a two-year deal. Who so they weren't convinced about? He was good, probably overworked last year. Now you hope Huso's coming back. So are those the three, and that's why Steve carried three all year. Goaltending, would it shock me? I don't know, but you got to move somebody to do something. Defense, they got a lot of contracts there, but they've got seven defensemen who can play, and Simon Edmondson, who's performing really well and up and coming in Grand Rapids, obviously be here next year, has been somewhat blocked. But you've got seven D who can play, and Justin Hall's a healthy scratch most nights. When he's been in, he's been okay, hasn't hurt, but he's got a three-year deal. Could they add some bite on the back end? Yes, probably. Could they add another scoring winger left side in particular? Yes, I think so. But I don't believe Steve's going to get in acquiring somebody who's older with a lot of term. So how creative could you be? Could he be a pick up something for futures even and be a facilitator because he's got the cap room? I guess you could. Um, so uh, a scoring winger, I would think, even though you got Fabi right now on the fourth line, it sounds silly, but maybe a bigger body or in that way and just to have some depth. It's a great question. I'd, I'd say grit on the blue line. I would have loved to have seen Rad, Radko Gudis on this team who went to his buddy Pat Verbeek out in Anaheim. That would have been one guy I would have liked. Um, so though there isn't much, I, I don't know. If Steve Eisenman does something, Bigger than what we think? Would I be shocked? No, because of Steve Eisman, really nobody knows. So I'm not sure. Are they thinking they're a Stanley Cup contender? I don't believe they're thinking that. But do they think that if they can get into the playoffs, can they make some noise and maybe cause somebody some problems in the first round? Yes. So might they be thinking add that way? I, I wouldn't surprise me. How much of the success do you, do you put on Derek Lalonde? To me, he's he's one of the most interesting coaches in, in the league. The path he's taken to get to where he is his ability to kind of speak to almost every type of player because of the roles he's had and and what he's done in Detroit. I mean, obviously, you know, we've gone through that they added this year and and certainly that helps, but they they look like a far different team than they, than they have in the past. They do. And he's so communicative. He's uh, wonderful to deal with. The players find that too. He's honest. He's fair. He's very open about what he thinks. And he's got a wonderful staff too. Alex Tangay and the power play, even though there's a lot more now to work with has been great. Uh, Bob Bugner, Jay Verity, the penalty kill has been outstanding. As I look on my notes, they've only allowed eight power play goals against since December the 12th and only six games the past 28 have the Red Wings allowed a power play goal. And uh, it's really remarkable. And those eight since September 12th, three came in one game that the LA Kings scored. So crazy how good that's been. And I think Bob Bugner and Verity deserve a lot of credit. Tangay, I mean, they, both their special teams are in the pot, top 10 right now. So I think that's a part of it. And what Derek Lalone does is he delegates. He lets those guys handle things. He doesn't worry about the little things. Uh, he speaks with them, obviously, but he delegates very well. And I think everybody appreciates that. Well, I mean, that's what he learned with John Cooper, too, right? I mean, John Cooper yeah. did a lot of delegating to his coaches, even let him talk to the media some days where John just wanted to have a break <laughs> right. from doing that, too. Still does it, right? You're right. I guess yep. The last one for me is Dylan Larkin. He bought in. He's a local guy. He's a Detroit guy. He, he bought into this at a time where it would have been very easy to not buy in. And we've seen him wear his emotion publicly, privately. I'm sure you've seen it. What do you think all this means to him right now? Team on a six-game winning streak. Playoffs right there. I mean, speak to the idea of what Dylan Larkin is going through right now. Well, nine seasons, first year in the playoffs, Jeff Blaschel, when when he came, and that was uh, the last time. It means so much to him. And I, I'll i tell you this story. We, we did uh, feature one-on-one uh, with Dylan. And yes, it means a lot being the local guy. And he's always been a rink rat. And his parents are at every game. And... Uh, Dylan's just a wonderful guy to deal with. And we were, we were talking about family and that was one of my questions. And it led into what is the Red Wing family to you? And he said, 
it's going to give me chills thinking about it. And I asked him the same thing today, and it was still very similar answer. And we go back to the Toronto game. It was a month ago now, maybe, or three weeks or so. It was Red Wings had a bad day of travel. It was after a game at home. Couldn't get out that night. And then the next day, couldn't get out. And we didn't arrive at Scotiabank in Toronto until 6 o'clock. And they pushed the game back a little bit. So really, an hour and a half or so before puck drop, the team arrives. We were we were on the uh, the plane, the charter we had to take because our plane wasn't in commission. And uh, as we're leaving the plane, and I said to Rasmussen and Kane before we got off, and I said, you know you guys are winning this game. And they said, we feel the same way. I said, when you don't have time to think about the crap that we've been through, that's when it's best. So Dylan referred to that night and he said, when Andrew Kopp, got the go-ahead goal in a few minutes late in that game. And Detroit had played pretty well for what they'd gone through. He said, just get me the shot, if you would, please, of the bench. Send it to me. And he said this on camera, and we did, and our Bally crew sent him the clip. And if you see the guys on the bench from Christian Fisher and Fabry, Fabry everybody just jumping up and down on the bench, and then Raymond scored to put out a reach, and it's a 4-2 win. And both shots, and the guys just going crazy. Dylan said to me, that gives me chills. That's family. And that tells you all that you need to know about this Red Wing team. And this is a very closely knit group. And they just love that night. And uh, they've been pretty good since the new year, 16-4-2, and two, uh, second best record in the league. So they've, they've had some downs this season, but it's been resilient. Alex Lyon, bad game, bounces back. So these guys, and it, it's guys like, like David Perron and Christian Fisher and Patrick Kane and DeBrinket who've been through it all. So Dylan, the point to your question, Dylan's not alone anymore. He doesn't have to feel the pressure. And he learned from Henrik Zetterberg. And he told me he learned when to speak up. And it's still a process for him. He's still learning when to do that. But he doesn't have to be the guy all the time. I'm on the back end now with Petrie adding to Sherratt. And Sider learning from them too. Um, I think it's taken some of the heat off him where Dylan can just be Dylan and be himself, lead when he needs to. And it's helped with the surrounding group. Awesome, Ken. Well, we really thank you for joining us. And it, it's been one of the best stories since January. You talked about their record. I can't wait to see having covered so many playoff games in Detroit, mostly in the old Joe Lewis, all of them in the old Joe Lewis arena. But I, I can't wait to see, you know, if Detroit makes it, what the playoff fever is going to be like there and to hear your calls. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I honestly think these guys are building off the Lions and they saw the line fandom. And this is a football town, even though it's called hockey town. It's a football town. But they're feeding off that. And I think the fans are. They're excited. They saw what the Lions did. Yeah, didn't get to the ultimate goal. But even feeling that. And uh, 20 of the last 22 have been sellouts at Little Caesars. So the fans are feeling it. Thank you. Well, before we let you go, doesn't yeah. Derek Lalonde want Dan Campbell to come in the room yeah. and talk to the team? Next on the list, apparently, he said he, he's sending out the bat signal. I'm not sure about that, but it likely will. <laughs> It, it, it likely will, I'm sure, and uh, the players would love that. So, you know, he's a Bills fan, but he supports the Lions too. So, love you. All great. right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ken. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Great stuff there with Ken Daniel, Sean. And I got to say, he did mention a guy I wanted to talk about. In the interview, we mentioned Pat Verbeek, right? He talked about Patrick Kane living with Pat Verbeek uh, when he played for Honey Baked in Detroit and all that. Well, I saw Pat Verbeek last night, Wednesday night at Madison Square Garden, the Anaheim Ducks general manager was taken in the game between the New York Rangers and the Columbus Blue Jackets, and it's trade deadline time. It's not out of the ordinary to see a general manager pop up in a building at any time, really, throughout the course of the year, but I thought that one was interesting. Definitely took note of that one, and I know Ranger fans did as well because there's been a lot of talk about needs for the New York Rangers who've won 11 of their last 12 games. They had a 10-game winning streak, lost to Columbus, then them beat them. First team to 40 wins this season. And there's been talk about needs for the Rangers at this deadline, center and right wing. And there's been a lot of talk about the Anaheim Ducks having what they want. And there's Pat Verbeek at Madison Square Garden taking in a game between the New York Rangers and the Columbus Blue Jackets. Should we read into this, Sean? Yeah, of course we should. I, look, it's not like showing up at the at the LA Kings, right? It's not a drive down the freeway. Right. It's come across the country you know, and, and look, this is a very rich area to scout in the week before, right? You can hit New York, you can hit the island, you can hit the Devils, you can hit the Flyers, all of whom could be selling or buying. But you should read into it. Like, I, I think there's fits there. And, and I think, you know, if you, again, if you look at our power rankings and you look at me being the outlier with the Rangers, I had them at seven. Like, 
to me, their holes are ginormous. Look, the Rangers can walk into any building and beat the doors off of somebody. Mm -hmm. You know who could do that last year? The Bruins. Yeah. And you know what happened? They got in a seven-game series where somebody figured them out. Somebody figured out how to attack them, how to match up with them, how to keep games close and get lucky. Somebody's going to match up with the Rangers, and the way they're presently constituted will match them into submission. If you have three lines and 4D, which every elite team does, the Rangers are in a world of hurt. Third lines win playoffs. What's the Rangers' third line? You don't have to sell me on this, right? This has been a topic of mine for a while. You can't go into the playoffs if you you cannot go into the playoffs if the New York Rangers with Johnny Brodzinski as your third line center. You cannot do it. I think Johnny Brodzinski has been a nice player for them. He's a versatile player. He could play on their fourth line. He could be a healthy scratch that they pop into the lineup when need be. They gave him a contract because he's earned the contract. He's been a solid player for them. But you can't go into the playoffs with Johnny Brodzinski as your third line center. You can't go into the playoffs with two AHL call-ups. Brodzinski, by the way, was an AHL call-up. You can't go into the playoffs with two AHL call-ups, no matter how big they are, in Adam Edstrom and Matt Rempe on your fourth line. You can't do it. Heck, I could even give you an argument that you can't go into the playoffs with Eric Gustafson as your on your third defense pair. There's three positions right there for the New York Rangers that need to be filled. Center, third line center, right wing, because we I don't believe that Capo Caco is ready to play right wing on the top line with Chris Kreider and Mika Zibanejad. I think he defers to Zibanejad and Kreider when he was playing on the third line. They just moved him up to the top line. Right, He played his first game back on the top line with Zibanejad and Kreider Wednesday night against Columbus. Really didn't do much. That line didn't really do much, okay? He's better on the third line right now. So that opens up. You need a you need a first line right wing, or you need a right wing in general. You need a third line center, and a luxury would be to get somebody else to play on your third defense pair with Braden Schneider. Three holes, three holes that they have to fill. They can fill all of them. It takes away the AHL call ups. Maybe you only need maybe you only use one of them, or you use none of them, right? It, it, then they look like a complete team. Right now, they're winning games, not as a complete team. But I got to give them a lot of credit. They're winning games. They've beaten some good teams. They beat Dallas. They beat Tampa. They beat Colorado. I mean, they've beaten good teams in this stretch. So you got to give them a lot of credit for that. But overall, there's holes. And if they were to match up, even against a team like Detroit, Sean, it could be a struggle for them if if they go in as constituted. That's why they know they have to make moves. Anaheim has some players that fill those holes for them. The two most obvious ones that we've talked about are Frank Vitrano, who you did an interview with on our podcast with All-Star Weekend, and Adam Henrique. What's the cost? But there's Pat Verbeek at Madison Square Garden watching the New York Rangers and Columbus Blue Jackets. So let's not discount the fact that he's also watching them. Maybe there's something working on with Columbus for a bigger picture deal. Who knows, right? Who's he looking at from the Rangers? Who are they trading? Is it Kako? Is it a fourth-line guy that they just called up like Adam Edstrom? Is he evaluating anybody that's on the NHL roster? Are the Rangers willing to trade anybody off the NHL roster? I got to think they are right now, or else why is Pat Verbeek at the NHL game? Well, I have no idea, but Hartford's a hop, skip, and a jump, right? But if they trade off their roster, they're in the same problem, right? You're trading away pieces to add pieces, but you you need to add pieces without losing anything. Right, that's how that's how tight they are. Right, you, mm-hmm. you talk about their third pair defensemen. Who gets through twenty five games of the playoffs without having a defenseman hurt? Right, and there's their other defenseman is Zach Jones, who's a rookie and he hasn't really looked all that good this season in the limited time he's gotten. He's also not a big guy. He's not a physical guy. He's exactly what Eric Gustafson is. They need a guy like Joel Edmondson to play on that third pair, steady, reliable, predictable. Just a guy that you know is going to be play well in front of the net, battle in the corner, move the puck up the ice. Not a guy who's going to try to move the puck up the ice, bring it down the wall, go through his legs, make a seam pass. You don't need any of that on your third pair, right? If I'm the New York Rangers, if I'm Chris Jury, I'm looking at it and saying, I want Frank Vitrano, I want Adam Henrique, 
and I want Joel Edmondson. What's it going to cost me? That's pie in the sky. They're not going to be able to get all those guys without giving up a lot to do it. Dude, you sounded like one of the kids at the Willy Wonka factory. I know. <laughs> I want, I want, I want. <laughs> That's where they're at right now. But again, I you have to give them a lot of credit. And the most important thing for the New York Rangers is that who went they went ten and one, by the way, in the month of February after going five, seven, and two in January. Is Igor Shesterkin is back. He's playing really well. Seven and zero with a nine fifty three save percentage in the month of February for Igor Shesterkin. That is the most important thing for the Rangers. He is he is covering a lot of holes right now for that team. It's too much to ask for a, for him to do that in a long playoff run on a consistent basis. That's why they have to plug the holes. I mean, listen, Chris Drury has shown he's willing to make trades. He's done it. I expect them to look different. Whether it's a week from now, eight days from now, whatever, I expect them to have a different look. Like they play Saturday night in Toronto and they play Monday at home against Florida. Those are their only two games remaining before the deadline. And honestly, I'm looking at the game against Florida and said, that's the measuring stick game. If I'm Chris Jury, that's where I want to see what happens in that game. How do we match up against that team? And you don't base it off of one game, obviously. Maybe you wait a little bit if the prices are if, – if things are quiet to see how you match up and see what do we really need. How does Kako handle that if he's on the first line right wing, right? Like how does Gustafson handle that? Because that's a team to me that they're the model of what you want to look at right now and the measuring stick for the Eastern Conference. And the Rangers look nothing like them. No, they don't. Other than at goaltender, they look nothing like them. No, they don't. They're a completely different team. And Florida is a team that you know is is more built for playoff success. But if the Rangers can fill two or three two of those holes, they'll look a lot better. So we'll see what they can do. But it was just very interesting. Pat Verbeek, the Anaheim Ducks GM, there, and who knows? Maybe he was there to watch Kirill Marchenko from the Columbus Blue Jackets, and we're over over analyzing everything here for no reason at all. Maybe he just wanted a slice of New York pizza. Maybe. maybe. Maybe you wanted the prime rib sandwich at Madison Square Garden, which is very good, by the way. You know, you got to limit how many you have of them because they're huge. And, you know, we're watching our figures here, Sean. Well, yeah, now that it's your birthday, you probably had a lot, or you're probably going to have a lot of cake. So you should lay off the prime rib sandwiches. <laughs> I didn't have the prime rib sandwich last night. Uh, let's go out west. First, there's two teams out west the uh, Vancouver Canucks, Elias Patterson. It looks like the extension that we've talked about, the new contract. That everybody's been waiting on could be happening here soon. There's been reports of that. I'm not surprised. Eight year deal, more than likely, it makes a lot of sense. But beyond a bigger bigger picture for the Canucks, Sean, Jim Rutherford, who's their president of hockey operations, and Patrick Alvine, their GM, I don't think they're done. If Jake Gensel is seriously available, don't be shocked if the Vancouver Canucks are looking at him as well. How they afford it remains to be seen. But there's ways. There's ways to make it happen. Rutherford knows him. Tockett knows him. Right? I mean, there is a fit there. And you look at the Canucks right now. They're not playing all that well. Maybe it's a blip. Maybe they just need a little bit more pop as they get into the playoffs. A playoff performer. Well, hello. Jake Gensel is a playoff performer. I think they need another jolt, right? I think they need something to kind of wake them up. And you wonder if it's just that post-trade kind of lull, right? Like the, So we know the team that we have. This is the team. We know we're in the playoffs. You know, we, we've made that cushion, and maybe we take our foot off the gas. And they're not a team that's made to take their foot off the gas, right? They, they need to go at 100% all the time. But nobody knows the – ways of getting around the salary cap better than Jim Rutherford, right? And and to maximize his chips and look, he's not going to be there forever. I mean, that's just a fact, right? Like he and you always wonder about GMs, right? Like if you were a GM of a team and you knew that your tenure there wasn't going to be that long, what do you care about the future? Morally, I guess you should. Right, you want to give something to the next person and be like, but you got a chance to win a Stanley Cup and to be remembered as the guy who brought the Stanley Cup to Vancouver. Like, trade all my assets. That's it. I mean, you have a chance to win the Stanley Cup. Care? You don't think about the next guy. You don't think about your age. You don't think about your tenure there, your legacy or whatever. You think about, we have a chance to win the Stanley Cup this year. Let's go out and get that, 
get the guys that are we think are going to be the ones that really help push us over the top. So, and there's famili- the familiarity there. It, it makes a lot of sense. But but I'll ask you this question to go back to the East. Do you think the Penguins trade him? I I do now. Like they just haven't done what they need to do. Look, and and, they, and they're in a place now where they're, where they're seven points out, but they have four games in hand. They win all those games. They're right there, right? Like, and that's almost what I see happening is is they're going to win. Like Sidney Crosby's been playing so well, right? Like he's basically been like, I'm going to drag us into the playoffs. I don't care about how bad this team is. Like, and he's played out of his tree. But the closer they get, the harder it is to trade him. Because then you're like, well, if we get him back, we're going to be even better, and, and, and off we go. And then you look at that team, and they're a one-line team. In the playoffs, it's going to be a disaster, right? Yeah. Like, So I, I, I think you have to bite the bullet and trade him. It's really hard for Kyle Dubas to do it because he doesn't have a currency yet in Pittsburgh. But he's not trading Crosby. He's not trading Maul. He's not trading a franchise icon. He's trading a good player who's been a really good player for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I don't think you need the currency to do it. I think you have to do it if you're them because they're no better with Jake Gensel than they were four weeks ago. He's a great, he's a really good player, but they haven't made, they didn't make the playoffs last year and they're not in position to make one, make it this year. And they've had him. might as well trade them, get younger. We talked about that last week, but it opens the door to the question. Who's taking third place in the metropolitan division. There can't be six teams that go to the playoffs from the Atlantic. There's gotta be three. From the Metro, we know two. We know two of them, the Rangers and, and the Hurricanes. They want it. They're in. They've been playing really well. Who's the third team? Is it Philadelphia? Are they going to look exactly the same as they do now, eight days from now? Well, they just lost Jamie Drysdale too, right? He's on injured reserve. He's out. Travis Konechny's hurt. He's missed three games in a row. Is it still Pittsburgh? I mean, what about the Devils? I mean, the Devils haven't looked like they want it. You know, there's talks of Tyler Toffoli potentially being traded to a team like the Los Angeles Kings that lost Adrian Kempe. And Toffoli obviously has won the Stanley Cup with the Kings. Who's going to be third, Sean? I never thought I would say this because I've thought it all year. I thought it was a mirage. The Philadelphia Flyers. I agree. Stuff happens and they don't go away. Like you keep on saying, oh, that's the one. Well, Carter Hart left. What, what have they got in goal? Win. Jamie Drysdale, hurt. What are they going to do? Win. Konechny, out. What are they going to do? Win. They're just one of those teams that it seems like the culture is bigger than the skill. And it's more important. And, And they don't go away and they don't give up. And they hold the position now and nobody else seems willing or able to put together a winning streak to challenge them. The Washington Capitals are what, minus 30 in goal differential? Yeah. Like that's crazy for a contender, right? And and then the Devils, you know, the Devils have been ahead one to nothing in 13 of their games this year, I think. In every other game, they've been behind one nothing. Do you know how hard that is? And what a testament it is to that team that they're even in contention when almost 75% of their games, they're down one nothing, That's nuts. You just scored on the Devils, though. During this podcast, you scored a goal on the Devils, right? That's how they have a huge, huge issue. They're not making the playoffs with what they have right now. My Michigan move's pretty good. That is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Devils. I don't believe in the Penguins. It's not the Capitals. The Islanders have not shown me much. They haven't gotten a Patrick Waugh bump. It's the Flyers. I also don't think the Flyers have to. I, I, I think it's 50-50, and maybe I'm even leaning the other way. Maybe I'm leaving closer now to Sean Walker and Nick Sealer staying in Philadelphia. And not necessarily to make the playoffs, but they can re-sign these guys. Why not? They're a good defense pair. They're a solid second defense pair. They're not old. They're not you know, veteran guys grizzled with over 1,000 games played, and you, don't, you, know, you got to move them. They're not going to cost. They're, they're not going to cost you. It's not an eight-year deal you're looking at here at you know an eight-year, sixty million dollar deal for any of these guys. I don't think. Sign them. They're good, and they're Philly. Yeah, they really are. They really are. 
They, they're, they're very much within the culture of that team and city. Yeah. And I think they should keep him, sign him. It's not going to cost you that much. There's no reason if you're the Philadelphia Flyers why you have to give those guys away at the deadline and lose and have to retool it again next year. Like, use them. You have them. Use them, right? Make the playoffs. Get it, Get the experience. I'm not saying you have to mortgage your future to do it, but you're not mortgaging your future. You're actually enhancing your future probably if you re-sign these two guys before the deadline or even just keep them and re-sign them. You have to still have a couple of months to get it done, right? I think that's what they should do. And to end it, I did touch on this in the mailbag this week. John Tortorella is a Jack Adams winner right now. I mean, Rick Tockett's done a terrific job in Vancouver. But with everything that the Flyers have dealt with, and you kind of you went over it before, how is John Tortorella not the Jack Adams Award winner right now? I don't know. I, I mean, I would put Derek Lalonde in that conversation. Um, you know, we talked about that a little bit in, in our interview with, with Ken Daniels. But, um, no, John, John's been unbelievable. And, you know, you talked about the Rangers and the Carolina, you know, wanting it and, and being in position. Finishing first becomes really important because you're going to beat the Philadelphia Flyers most likely, but they're going to beat on you. They're going to beat on you and not in the old Philly way. They're just going to make you pay for everything that you earn against them. And that's the last thing you want if you have designs on a deep run is to run into a team like that in the first round that's just going to make it excruciating. Right. And if you finish first, you're probably looking at either Detroit or Toronto or Tampa who are all probably better than the Philadelphia Flyers as teams. But over the course of a seven-game series, they will not beat on you like the Flyers will. You just have to knock down some of their skill, and you can win that series. You know, And, and all three of them have issues. Like The Lightning have defense issues right now. They don't have a goaltending issue. They have defense issues. The Red Wings team speed a little bit, and who's the goalie? And, and Toronto defense, goaltending. I mean... Philly has, there's no gaping holes, right? But there's no star power either. That's why they're just going to beat on you. So, yeah, I agree with you, Sean. Finishing first is huge. Listen, one more podcast probably until the trade deadline. One more. And then we'll talk all about the playoffs coming up after that. But one more to go before the trade deadline, which is 3 p.m. Eastern next Friday, March 8th. Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a long eight days for sure. There's going to be a lot of things that happen between now and then. Hopefully the the deadline itself is an interesting one. The actual day has been a little bit of a dud the last few years because of the trades that were made before it. Um, and we don't have to pick our Olympic teams and assorted other <laughs> fillers. Um, I'm glad we're not doing a live podcast on that day because we'd have to start talking about, I don't know what, Christmas salad maybe, Dan. No, over the rest no, we're not talking about that ever again. And... Uh, but yeah, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to get together next week and see how the landscape's changed. And then the week after that, because then we sprint. Sprint. And you know how good a sprinter each of us are. We sprint right into the playoffs. And happy birthday to me. Yes, and happy birthday to you. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> Had to get that in. Happy anniversary as well to Sidney Crosby. Yesterday was the anniversary of the golden goal in the Olympics. You and I were fortunate enough to sit next to each other and cover it. And that's how I remembered it was your birthday, because your birthday was the next day after Canada won yep. in that incredible overtime game. We went out to dinner. We saw some acts of violence while we were going out to dinner, and then you wanted me to go out to celebrate your birthday, and I refused in one yes. of the rare times I've ever said no to going out because I knew it was not in my best interest, and you've held it against me ever since. But that's how I always remember your birthday. Whenever they say, congratulations to Sidney Crosby on the golden goal, I say, oh, Dan's birthday's coming up. Yeah, that was then. Now I'm just hoping to get through my birthday. That's it. <laughs> well, anyway, listen, this is fun. Ken Daniels was great. Eight days to the trade deadline. Enjoy the hockey.